Good morning, everybody. Let's give more students a chance to join. And we'll start in a couple of minutes. Yes, new background. I am standing outside of HEC. Are right, the toy compiler grades accurate? Um, we'll see, uh, there's a lot of questions. So the TAs uh, wrote some scripts to automate the grading. Uh, and you know, I got several questions from students uh, who didn't think the grades were accurate. I think one of the main things, uh, which I, I hope was clear enough, was that it wasn't, the task wasn't just to sort of hand copy something and turn it in. It was to make a buildable and runnable piece of software. And so we evaluated it based on whether the tool build or ran, build and run, ran. I also put the grading scheme into the assignment. Yeah, so the, the point of this exercise was to practice using make GCC and Git, uh, not whether you can, you know, hand copy code. As some of you probably realized, it's uh, much easier just to copy code than you might think. Uh, I thought this was kind of kind of interesting. It's not not so not so simple to do. Uh, but the grading scheme was this, and you know if anyone has has issues or they think they got the wrong grade or you want me to hand check it, come to office hours. Um, yeah. So if you submitted anything, then I gave two points for that. If the program built, that is, you could run make, and it compiled a program, five points, and 10 points if you got it to build and run correctly. It's a little hard to grade it because I, I gave you the source code, so it's hard to have a, a spread of different grades. It was really just a, an exercise to make sure you could use make and GCC and Git. So we have about half the class. What time are the, uh, the new office hours, by the way? The new office hours? The office hours haven't changed. Oh, they, were, they only were different last week. So that was only, that was just for, let's see, when did I announce this? Yeah, so make up office hours for nine. So that was just for last week. Okay, so they're the still office, right after class? They're still right after class at one. Yeah, it's just I, I had a, a meeting just that week to, uh, to go to during that time. So yeah, sorry for making that was a little bit of a me not um, preparing well enough. And also today's labs uh, may well let me let me check something real quick. So labs today may be different. Uh, so one of the TAs is unable to do labs today and. I'm still waiting back on the other TA to make sure that she can um, she can attend them. Uh, but I'll, I'll send an announcement before then. So somebody's let's see some other questions. Uh, so somebody asked about my grading scheme. I guess this is a little ambiguous. So I, sh I, I knew I should have written it this way. Um, let me edit this while you're here. So these are cumulative. For any submission that builds for any submission that builds and runs correctly. So they're, they're cumulative. 
yeah, just yeah, come to office hours if you're if you're having an issue. So somebody's also asking if I can go over the list out versus list in program one. Is this about the toy compiler, the argument list thing? Oh, for the for project one. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I can I can do that before we start. Yeah. So if you have any questions about the toy compiler, uh, your grade, come to office hours. And I'll, yeah, let me go over the project one a little bit before we start today's lecture. Yeah, you can use the dash W. So for diff, people are asking about what the diff command is. You can use dash W to ignore white space as one student helpfully pointed out last week. Uh, dash B, I think, ignores empty lines maybe. So this is today's lecture. Okay, let's, let me go over questions on project one first. Uh, so yeah, today's lecture is up and there's also a homework for next week on today's class. I'll go over that a little more. It's just five questions. It's shouldn't, shouldn't take too long, uh, but we'll, we'll, we can, we'll, we'll see. Uh, hopefully today we'll make it clear how to do that. But all right, let's, let's, add, let's go over some questions on the Toy compiler. Oh no, I'm sorry, not the toy compiler. On project one. So the first question was, what's the difference between argument list opt and argument list? All right, using the word opt is is really a, a convention in grammar writing to say that this grammar construct is optional in the input. For instance, a function definition usually has a list of arguments, but the language may also permit you to have no arguments. And one way to express that in a grammar is to have a, an argument list that is one or more arguments and then have a separate construct that says the argument list may either exist or may just be an empty string. So let me go to the grammar to show you what I mean by this. And I'll go over the ground. Oh, I think your screen isn't showing right now. If you, oh, you, thank uh, you. If that was your oh. intent. <laughs> yes, that was my intent. Uh, thank you. That was definitely my intent. Thank you. Yeah, that's on.
So technical difficulties as usual. Let me hopefully I can share my screen. Okay. Can anyone not see my screen? It's all good now. Okay. Of course, I made it not good by stopping the share. But... So unfortunately, I cannot see the chat anymore. Okay, can you guys see me and see my screen? Okay, so, so, so sorry about this. I uh, had some strange difficulty. I mean, first of all, I was crashing when I shared my screen and now I cannot see the chat either. So I'm viewing the chat on another device. And uh, okay, so apologies for this. Let me answer these questions about project one. Uh, where is it? Okay, so people were asking about the argument list versus argument list opt. And as I was as I was trying to get at before, it's really just a way to describe what happens when there's uh, an empty string or some part of the language which doesn't have to be expressed in every utterance in the language. For instance, for argument lists, you can either have some list of arguments, which is here, a comma c, or you can have a function that has no arguments. And one way to express this in the grammar is to make an argument list that always has zero or more elements. Oh, I'm sorry, make an argument list that always has one or more arguments in it, and then make a separate construct that allows you to choose between an empty argument list and an argument list. That is a one or more argument list versus an empty argument list. And this is actually missing a semicolon. I'll have to see if that's on the, on the website. Uh, okay, other questions on project one?
how do we go about testing it using the test cases on GitHub? Just run the run the comp your compiled compiler um, using. Oh, okay. So there should be instructions on running it in the project. So here is, uh, in this complete example, it'll show you how to run it. Also in getting started, it'll show you how to run it. The actual commands are here. So you just cat to, if you remember cat just prints out a, uh, prints out the file. And then you pipe that output into your simple C compiler. So that's it. Uh, parameter list is also missing it. No, it's not intentional. Yeah, these are, I guess Bison is just being permissive about this. Um, I mean, as long as it's working, I think Bison is just uh, accounting for that. Yeah, sorry about that. Let me see if that's what I put on the web as well. Yeah, there, those are those are mistakes. So I'll, I'll push these. I'll push these fixes. But I think it doesn't affect the. I think it it, it should still work, uh, regardless of that. So sorry, I'm just having to set up everything again because Okay. Okay, uh, any other questions about the project 1? Just remember that it's due in what is it? 2 weeks from now. So I gave uh, try to give a good amount of time for the first project just so you can kind of get oriented. Uh, but uh, because I, I made a little mistake that student caught that these two homeworks were due on the same day that they were assigned. So I pushed those each uh, back by a week, but that means that on the same day that the project is due, there's going to be a, a homework due as well. So my, my apologies for that. Uh, but the homeworks are meant to be pretty straightforward. Um, so, you, can, you know, and you have time to come to office hours twice before that homework is due four times, including the TA office hours. Okay, other other questions on the project or homework. So again, if you have issues with the toy compiler grade, please come to office hours. I think a, a lot of the main thing was that students weren't um, trying to actually compile and run, run the toy compiler. If you just, so yeah, let's, let's just come to office hours and let's, uh, let's talk about an office hours. Cause the exercise was really about using this, the tools rather than can you accurately copy code? I mean, I, I don't have any doubt that that students can do that, but it was really an exercise to get you to use make and get NGCC and get it to work properly. So let's yeah, just come to office hours and let's let's see what's going on with your with your code. All right, let's go over today's today's class. Today's class is going to be on regular expressions in finite state automata. And the lecture notes are already online. So let me get the Slides open again. Sorry, I'm having to set all this up again. Here's my 
speaker notes. Oh yeah, somebody mentioned discrete too. So we're gonna, we're, we'll be talking about that today as well. This is almost like a little primer for discrete two. If you've taken discrete two, hopefully this will be a little bit, a little bit easier or maybe a little bit uh, more scary, but this is gonna be a more kind of intuitive and um, hopefully I'll give you the intuition behind this and then we can leave a lot of the formal theory, some of the formal theory to discrete two, like proofs and things like that. So we're gonna talk about regular expressions, which I think some of you have heard of. We're gonna go into some examples of using regular expressions and then we're gonna see the background behind how they're actually implemented. So this is a case, uh, first of all, our, our first um, new, for some of you, mental model of computation that we're gonna use in this class that's different from the C random access storage model. We're gonna see a new uh, model of machines that uh, we can use to solve lots of useful problems in computer science that may be easier to reason about than trying to think about C programs. Uh, and this is what I talked about in the first week of class that every great programmer has, can, has flexibility with which mental model of computation they wanna use. And then you can pick the best one that's the right tool for the computing job that you're trying to solve. And regular expressions is a really great example of this. So regular expressions are used for doing string pattern matching. And if you've ever wondered how, say, um, in your code editor, how the search works there, uh, particularly when you're using wildcards, uh, regular expressions are one of the techniques that we can use for doing string pattern matching. And so we can look for patterns like if you have a long sequence of text, pick out all the phone numbers or pick out all the email addresses. Or in the case of a compiler, pick out all the language tokens, like tell me which one is an identifier versus a number versus a keyword. Regular expressions can be used to express this pattern in strings uh, so that a machine can then automatically detect whether there are strings that match this pattern. And somebody noticed that they've played with these in Python and I would I would imagine that, um, so, so any uh, sort of professional or full-time programmer has probably 99% of them have run into regular expressions in some capacity or another. It's uh, probably one of the more common parts of theoretical math and, and program and computer science that have entered into really widespread industrial use, you know, besides compilers themselves. Compilers themselves, are, of course, are used all the time. And so the, the, the question I want to pose to you first before we get into a solution is, say I just wanted to, well, let's say phone numbers. So email addresses are a little trickier. So let, let's look at, think about just phone numbers or, or really any string pattern matching. If I just gave you the exercise, here's, you know, um, several gigabytes of ASCII text. Can you find all of the phone numbers in that ASCII text? How would you write that program? And I have the, the chat here on my other phone. Parse through the characters and match the sequence. Well, that's kind of the definition of the problem. And as we'll see next time, you actually don't need parsing, the technical meaning of parsing. But by parse through, I'm assuming you mean like in our toy compiler, we walk through the characters one sequence at a time. String compare, yeah, string compare. Well, how does string compare work? That's the question is you don't have string compare you've got assembly code or you have the C without C without a standard library. How would you, how would you do this? So traverse the linked list. Uh, remember we have ASCII files here. If you remember from a couple weeks ago, ASCII files are just a raw sequence of bytes. So let's assume like the toy compiler, we've got F get C. We have a, we, we can read in one character at a time. How would we write that code? Somebody asked a really good question. Do the numbers have dashes or parentheses? So this brings us back to the same kind of problem we have with defining language. What do we mean by a phone number in the first place? And so in, in, in email addresses, somebody's saying locate the at symbol for ASCII. That, that's also a really good point. So what do we mean by locate? What do we mean by the actual phone number or email address? What is the definition of that? And so all these are really good questions that are kind of circling around 
two points. One is how do we specify the thing we're trying to search? And two is once we have that specification, or once we know what we mean by a phone number, how do we actually write a program to, to search that? So somebody's saying, couldn't a regex be used to represent an email? Well, yeah, this is exactly the point. Um, so let's say I give you a regular expression. Let's, let's, let's define a, a pattern we actually want to match for this phone number. And uh, I'll just do it in using in, uh, English language. So let's say we want to match a sequence of three digits followed by a hyphen, then followed by a sequence of four digits. Okay, so this, this, this resolves the question of do we mean, do, do, can there be uh, parentheses in it? Do they have to be separated by dashes? So let's say this is a simple, you know, old school US phone number where it's a three digit um, what, exchange, I think it's called, and then a four digit number separated by a hyphen. Well, yeah, so somebody's asking, do we define the string in anything in programming or, some, or, or any kind of uh, rigorous science or math or, or engineering? Half of the problem is, half of the, um, task is defining what the problem is. So if somebody says, I want to make humans fly, well, we have to define what that means. If I just shoot you out of a rocket, is that flying? I mean, you have to define what you mean by that. Or do we want sustained flight? Or do we have to make a figure eight? So part of it is defining what the actual problem is. So, okay, let's define the problem as I want to identify three ASCII digits followed by a hyphen digit. This is all in ASCII code and then a sequence of four digits. So we, we can assume we have the infrastructure for reading and representing ASCII code. Just like in the toy compiler, we can read them one, one ASCII character at a time and match, is this the right ASCII character? So somebody's asking a really good question. What, is a, what does a digit mean? So somebody's saying, uh, does the first character need to be between zero and nine? So yeah, so a digit means any character between zero and nine, or to be really, really pedantic, that's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And to be really, really pedantic, the commas are part of the kind of meta language for describing um, a sequence of things. Yeah, so each character needs to be between zero and nine. There's three of those digits, followed by a hyphen, followed by a sequence of four characters. Okay, so is this specific enough for you to write some code? So how would you write some code to match this phone number? Okay, so we've got some code now. Somebody's saying a while loop. So while not EOF, have a for loop with eight iterations that reads in and compare. So it reads in each one. So what might that look like? So you, so you know, while character is not EOF, then we want to match something. So what does it mean to match a character if you're writing C code? How do you match a character? So we have C, we have, you know, F get C is compare the ASCII values. How do you compare the ASCII values? What's the construct you use in programming? What's the programming language construct you use in C to check whether two characters match? String compare. So string compare works for strings, not for characters. And we don't have, we don't have, so equality. Yeah, so how do we, how do we check? So we can check C equals a digit. So we can, you know, check if C equals zero. But what's the construct that we use to check whether that's true or not? Is digit is digit we'll check if it's a digit so let's say we have that let's say we have is digit an if statement right good so I mean I don't know if I'm um, being too uh, too pedantic here but yeah we need to use an if statement we need to do some kind of comparison that's how we know whether the string actually matches the sequence we expect so we're gonna have some just like in the toy compiler it's basically gonna be some combination of if statements and while loops. So while loops allow us to define some sequence of things iteratively, and an if statement allows us to check whether some individual character matches that. 
so that's, I mean, this is really all the tools you have in your toolbox when you're writing C, more or less, without, you know, the standard libraries are written, this, written in this way as well. Uh, and so basically, just like the toy compiler, we're going to read in one character at a time, and then basically just use a sequence of if statements and while loops to check to see whether, whether this matches the problem that we're trying to solve. So somebody mentioned we probably want to store the characters in a character array. So for our toy compiler, did we use a character array for our toy compiler? So no, we, we didn't actually need to use that. Um, and hopefully when we look into how regular expressions are seen, we'll see that um, if you're just doing recognition of strings or pattern matching, there's actually no need to store the, or have a, another storage for, for the string itself. All of the information about uh, what we've seen so far can be captured in states of the machine. But we'll get to that once we, uh, after we look at regular expressions a little more. Okay, so this is a little bit tedious. I was sort of being intentionally pedantic to get you to actually get to the actual coding of this. Um, because I want to point out that if you use regular expressions, we can express these kinds of patterns without having to write code, without having to actually get to the nitty gritty of writing code. As you probably noticed, even just copying the toy compiler, getting the code right for this kind of pattern matching is pretty tedious and pretty nuanced. So regular expressions are a way to, just like grammar, just like we do with flex and bison, they're a way to specify the thing we want to match without having to write C code. And then some algorithm will take that specification and automatically generate a pattern match for us. And this is in fact exactly how flex works. Flex takes regular expressions and automatically generates code to match those regular expressions. But we didn't really talk about yet what regular expressions are. Uh, so let's look at, uh, okay, so I don't have this program open yet. Let me open this. So I took this program written in Python, which uh, demonstrates regular expressions. So regular expressions, like most programming languages, has a library for using regular expressions. So you can take a look at this at your leisure if you haven't seen this before. Python is a really useful uh, language for just doing kind of quick coding or scripting exercises. Uh, but basically it gives us a library to take some regular expression, and I'll talk about what this is, and it, they even call it compile. It takes the regular expression specification and compiles it into a program that will do the actual code matching for us. But let's explore a little bit what regular expressions look like. So, okay. So firstly, regular expressions allow us to express sequences of characters. So as we described in our problem here, a phone number means a sequence of three ASCII digits. So in order to express sequence, that's really intuitive in regular expressions. Uh, so, the, so, so slash D is just the Perl or Python way of saying a digit, you know, any, any character between zero and one. Um, so think of it, you know, kind of like an escape code, but it's, you know, it's not kind of like an escape code, but just know that slash D just means some digit between zero and nine. So slash D means match one digit. If we want to do a sequence of digits, we just write the digits we want one after another. That's it. Pretty intuitive, right? So if we want to match a sequence of three digits, we just put slash D slash D slash D. And in my uh, box here in the center, this is the text that I want to match from. And in the bottom is the successful matches that I've found. So if I highlight all matches and I put some random text here. Well, okay, so let, let me make this less, less garbage. So this sequence is three digits. One, two, three. This sequence is two digits. Notice I use the number two here. So notice only the three-digit sequence matches. 
questions on this? Is this is this pretty straightforward, right? So what if I put a sequence of four digits? Ah, oh, yeah, okay, great. So somebody's already thinking ahead. So if I put a sequence of four digits, it's a little, maybe a little hard to see the coloration here. Uh, but notice that it highlights the first three digits. So this is, so I'm not doing the highlighting. The, the, the program that uses regular expressions to do the highlighting. So it's highlighting all the stuff that matches. So notice it's only matching the first three. Yeah, it didn't add it to groups. So I don't know why that is actually. Uh, maybe it needs to be updated or maybe something's broken here. Yeah, okay. I don't know why it's adding, not adding to groups. Let's just ignore groups for now. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure actually. Oh, somebody asked another interesting question. Why doesn't it add each combination of three digits from the longer string? This is a, this is a really good point. So it, uh, well, yeah, let's see how to describe this. This might become a little clearer once we look at, once we look at how these are implemented using state machines. Um, but the point is, is that this is a single sequence of five digits. Uh, and so we're just reading through them one at a time. Our pattern matching is assuming one sequence of input characters and it's going to, well, in this case, it's gonna match whenever it sees the first three digits and then we're, we've, we've successfully done the match. So if we wanna match um, all possible sequences in it, we'd have to treat those, at least for regular expressions, we'd have to treat those as three individual sequences of characters. So for instance, we'd have to treat them as these three separate strings or these, well, I should say these five separate strings. Now you could certainly write an algorithm that matches all possible sequences in there. And you could use regular expressions to do that, but there are, are more efficient out there are more efficient algorithms to do it for doing a specific addition algorithms so somebody asked another question would six digit make two matches so let's let's take it let's uh let's see what happens with six digits one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven so notice that the first three match then four five six match seven eight nine match Oh, it is actually matching one, two, three, four. Okay, so this is this is getting into some of the. Ten, oh no, ten is. Uh, okay, so this is actually matching more than I expect here. Three, one, two, three. Uh, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, yeah, it, is, it does look like it's just matching sequences of three. It's a little hard to see here. Yeah, 10 is not a digit. Yeah, sorry, so if this is seven, eight, nine, one, zero, one, 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 two. So it does seem to be matching them individually. And now this gets to the kind of practical issues with regular expressions. There are all kinds of settings in regular expressions to say, well, okay, do you wanna match the longest sequence? Do you wanna match every possible sequence in the input? Um, do you only want to match that specific sequence one time? Uh, so for instance, I can put some extra, and I, this, is, this is not something you need to like remember uh, right now, but you know, when, you get in, when you actually start using these in practice, there are special characters to signify the beginning and the end of a line. So for instance, uh, caret here means this matches the beginning of the line and money sign here matches the end of the line. This is kind of like uh, EOF. So somebody asked on Piazza about EOF. You can think of EOF as a non-character that signifies the end of the input. With regular expressions, we have those other kind of special characters or sentinel characters that signify the beginning and end of input or beginning and end of a line. Uh, so this is kind of in the pragmatic issues of 
regular expressions, which I don't, I don't really talk, wanna, I don't really want to talk too much about the engineering of regular expressions. If you look over a, any manual for regular expressions, they'll describe these issues like, do you want to match the longest sequence? Do you want to match every possible sequence in the input? Do you want to identify the beginning and end of input? I'm going to leave these as just kind of engineering issues around regular expressions tools that you can read in any manual. And we're not going to need that for this class. I really want to go into how these tools work behind the scenes. But first, let's, uh, let's finish our, our, um, our phone number matching tool. So here is my phone number. Please don't let, please don't let a machine automatically, oh, I can't write today, automatically find it. So here's my phone number, 555-1212. And so it's matching part of it, but it's really matching two separate sequences. And if I you know, don't highlight all matches, I just highlight the first match. Right now, it's only matching 555. Uh, so to do sequence, all I have to do is continue adding the sequence of characters that make up a you know, old school US phone number, which is three digits followed by a hyphen followed by four digits. And so now my uh, regular expression can automatically pick out this phone number from this text. So here is my um, international phone number. So let's highlight all matches. So you can see here, if I have a different definition of a phone number, it's only going to match that part of it that we specified in our regular expressions. All right, so that's sequence. So sequence is pretty intuitive. In the regular expression, the thing that you wanna describe all the possible phone numbers, you just put the sequence of characters that you wanna match in a row. Yeah, so somebody, somebody points out a really good point that in, if we were writing this as code, we would just basically have a sequence of if statements that say, is this a character? Okay, yes, move on. Is this another character? Yes, move on. If it's then, if the next thing is not a character, then, well, okay, we didn't fit, get to the end of our program that matches a phone number. So return an error or quit or continue looking. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a really good point. This would basically just be seven if statements that says, is, is, is digit, is digit, is digit, is hyphen, is digit, is digit, is digit, is digit. Is digit. That would be the program that we'd write for this. Okay, the next thing that we can express in regular expressions is alternation. We can express possible alternatives. Now, for D here, D is actually a kind of syntactic sugar for alternation. So let's, um, well, actually, let's, let's, uh, let's say we allow a country code in our phone number. So let's say we, so an international phone number has a country code, has a uh, plus followed by a country code followed by a phone number. And a country code is a um, Let's say for now it's a one or two digit sequence. I think there are also three digits there. I mean, there must be three digit sequences for country codes as well. So let's say for now it's just a one digit number. So we can add that by just having the plus symbol. So plus is uh, also used in regular expression. So we have to escape it. Followed by a digit, followed by a space. So if this is our international code, so this is a little hard to see here, but I have a space character here. I have a space character after the plus D. And so now notice that our international phone number matches. So any questions on this? Pretty, pretty straightforward, right? It's just more sequences. So yeah, so somebody asked, is this how control F works? 
So yeah, so control F uses a similar algorithm. So control F, um, if it doesn't allow wild cards or regular expressions, it's basically just sequence, matching a sequence. And one way to implement it is using regular expressions to do this. But we can also do alternation. So let's say we wanna match both a US-based phone number or an international phone number. We can use uh, alternatives to do this, an alternation to do this. So this is gonna get a little, well, well, let me show this with some simpler examples. So this phone number is kind of a hairy example. So let's say we wanna match, we wanna either match a, uh, we wanna either match the word let, or we wanna match the word machine. So to specify an alternation, we just use this pipe symbol and this pipe symbol, just kind of like logical or, although it's not actually logical or. Logical or says match the sequence on the left or match the sequence on the right. And just like in arithmetic, we can use parentheses to group together. We can use parentheses to group together regular expressions. So let looks like a word, but it's really just like, um, you know, I could also put a sequence of three digits here. It's really a sequence of, so machine is a sequence of seven digits. That's, you know, the ASCII code for M followed by the ASCII code for A followed by the ASCII code for C. And so now we can see that if I'm matching anything in my input, I'm either matching a sequence of three digits or I'm matching a sequence of these seven digits. Right, so somebody asked if we wanna search for the pipe symbol, do we need to escape it with a, a pipe with a backslash? And yeah, that's exactly right. So if this is machine pipe, then we use a backslash to escape special characters. So this is the same problem that we, we see in compilers and compiler compilers where we need some meta language to describe the language we're talking about. But if we only have a limited sequence of characters to use to describe languages, we need a way to distinguish between the meta language and the language itself. So this is an, an example of this where D is a character, an ASCII character, but if we wanna use it to signify a digit, we can use a sequence of digits to escape that character. And then of course, you know, the meta language has its own language description and gets into a, you know, a recursive nightmare of, of mind, working, mind warping recursion. But anyway, so let's just, um, yeah. So just, if you wanna use a character that's a special character for regular expressions, use the backslash for escape. This is a convention that's described in the regular expression language itself. Okay, so everyone all good on alternation? Now let's say we want to, okay, so parentheses are in other special characters. They're just for grouping order of operations, just like in arithmetic. So for instance, what's the difference between having a sequence of digits or machine uh, versus say, let's say I put the parentheses here. So here's a little bit of a mind bending question here. So this is saying a, I want a digit followed by another digit followed by either a digit or the character M followed by A-C-H-I-N-E. So what is a, so, so can somebody type a string that this regular expression will match? This is a little bit of a tricky question, but can anybody think of a, so somebody said one, two machine, okay. Or one, two, three, a sheen. So good, both of those match. That's exactly right, so very good, very good. So this is an illustration of alternation and the order of operations. So just like arithmetic and logic operations, regular expressions also have an order of operations. You can think of alternation like the plus of regular expressions, where it has a lower priority precedence versus sequence or concatenation is, is the term in regular expressions. Sequence has a higher precedence, so it goes first. And if we don't want that to happen, we use parentheses to make this precedence explicit. Okay, good, that's, that's good. You guys are following along quite well. All right, so that's alternation and sequence. And I wanna show you a little, a little um, something that's tr that might be sometimes tricky to wrap our heads around in regular expressions. But let's say we wanna match both an international and domestic phone number. How would we, so I'm just gonna restore our, 
regular expression here. So how would we match either the international version of a phone number, this is of course not the right one, or our domestic version? We can use alternation, right? So can somebody write a regular expression to match either a domestic phone number or an international phone number? What would a regular expression for that be? So right now I have the international one up. How can we modify that to match both this domestic phone number and our international phone number? Ah, is this, a, is this a harder exercise? Am I putting you on the spot? All right, so good. So somebody wrote, just take the two regular expressions, group them by parentheses because alternation has a lower precedence, and then just write both of these sequences. And that certainly works. Let me show you a more compact way to write this. So notice that these two regular expressions are identical, except one has something in the beginning that the other doesn't have. Ah, okay, so, 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 so good. So somebody wrote, well, okay, so, so good. So somebody wrote um, plus D or something, well, plus D space. I think you may have a little mistake. So somebody wrote plus D or space. So notice what happens here. We only match, um, basically we only match space and then a domestic phone number. So what went wrong here? We tried to match either plus one or a space, but that doesn't match. Yeah, okay, so remove the space, okay. But now we're matching nothing, right? We're matching nothing. Um, so the space should actually go after the plus one. But the point, the thing I want to point out here is that we can actually match an empty string. We can match nothing. And if you took discrete, this was called epsilon. So they, they use the Greek letter epsilon to mean an empty string, kind of like zero means no count. The zero of regular expressions is epsilon, and epsilon just means no characters. I want to match no characters. And basically, be be you can think of between any of these, uh, or you know, one way to think of it is that between any two characters in the input is an infinite number of epsilons. So just like if I have one plus two plus three, I can add any number of zeros here without changing the, the actual value of this. So in the same way, I can add any number of epsilons in my pattern matching, my, my regular expression, to being don't match anything here. And so we can use that, that notion of the empty string, matching, matching the empty string to provide, and with alternation, to match optional parts of our regular expression. And this comes back exactly to the question that somebody had in the beginning, what does argument list optional mean? And in, in uh, the grammar, we also have this notion of, of empty strings. We can also match, explicitly match, I, can, I wanna allow this grammar construct to be empty. And so this notion of matching empty space, um, it, you, you will see this all, all over the place when we look at regular expressions and parsing. And actually, they make, they make actually um, specifying problems a lot easier in some case. So somebody asked, does the parentheses or the pipe make it optional? Uh, so it's the combination of the, it's really the pipe. It's the pipe that makes it optional. The parentheses are just there to enforce order of operations. So let, so let, let me look, let's look at, uh, let's look at a simpler example where we're, we're not, you know, we don't have all this phone number stuff going on. So I can't highlight down here. All right, so let, let's just do some simple cases of epsilon. So, so let's say I want to say, uh, you know, this is the classic, you know, regular, uh, all regular expression discussions just use A, B, C, and D. So this is, so, so what, what are some um, strings that match A, B, or C followed by D? 
or actually let's make this simpler. So what's something that matches B or C? Yeah, B, C, A doesn't match, this doesn't match. And I'm just gonna use these um, special characters to enforce that a, a single line uh, must, we must match a complete single line. That, that's all the character. So if I say, you know, if I say um, A, B, C, that's not gonna match because I wanna only match a B or C as the entire string. Wow. Okay. So th this is this is a little this is a little broken. Oh no, it's not broken. Uh, I need parentheses. So so A B C doesn't match B or C. I have to either put C or B. Otherwise, yeah. Now if I take out now, okay. Let me put this in a bigger string here. So remember, the parentheses are just like in arithmetic. They're just to group operations. So what's going to match this, this regular expression? A, B, or C, D. So A, C, D. So A, C, D, C does not, you know, will also match. Uh, A, F, D won't match. A, D doesn't match. <clears throat> okay. So hopefully that, that's, that's clear to everybody with how this works. Now, if I take out the C here, so this is saying A, B or nothing, followed by D, what are some uh, strings that match this? Good, A, D is valid, exactly right. Okay, great, you guys are, you guys, at least, well, some of you at least are following along. Does it, is anybody not following along with this? Does anybody still have kind of questions about what's going on here? So somebody's saying epsilon, epsilon won't match because we have to have A followed by epsilon, followed by D, or A followed by B, followed by D. So in Python and Perl and programming languages, I don't, I don't know of any way to explicitly specify an epsilon. Epsilon, yeah, epsilon is not, a, there's no character for epsilon. Instead, you have to do this or empty string or nothing. This is Python syntax, right? So for C, it would be different. Uh, so so the, the syntax is actually not part of the language. I, C, Python, Java, they don't have regular expressions as part of their language. Instead, they're written as third-party libraries or, or, or part of the standard library. So C doesn't even have a standard library for regular expressions. Python standard library is written using Perl's syntax. So Perl is a language where regular expressions are actually part of the language themselves. You can just write regular expression pattern matching in the Perl language. Uh, but Python doesn't include that in the definition of the language. So think of this as, you know, think of simple C. We could write a, because we have strings in simple C, we could write a library where you pass in a string and it gives you uh, uh, a, a uh, regular expression um, a regular expression matching um, function, you know, gives you a, a tool that will give, you know, just like in Python, you call a library that says, well, you know, give, take this string and turn it into a regular expression matching uh, function. And then if you want to actually match a string, you, oh, where's the code for this? You call p.match. So this is the difference between a um, functionality that's part of the language versus functionality that is implemented using a library. If you watch Guy Steele's Growing a Language, he'll go into this, what is part of the core language which is, versus what's part of a library. So this is not strictly Python syntax. They even, they even call this Perl syntax. So they, they reference Perl explicitly here uh, because Perl was based on basically Perl, Perl uh, brought together a bunch of Unix command line utilities like grep and sed, which have their own syntax for regular expressions. And it tried to, and it create, I mean, it successfully created a programming language that is basically a mixture of programming in something like, um, you know, some scripting language like, well, it predates Python and JavaScript uh, and doing um, command line bash programming at the same time. So yeah, it's not strictly Python syntax, it's regular expression syntax. And Python's regular expression library supports it. So sorry, it's a little pedantic, but I wanna make that clear that this is actually a separate 
language with its own language specification and a Python library implements that regular expression specification. Okay, so the, the very last thing and probably one of the, the more uh, classic parts, what really makes regular expressions regular expressions is repetition. So let's say we don't just want to match US phone numbers, we want to match, you know, not everyone uses a three digit exchange, they might use a four digit exchange, they might use a 10 digit exchange. Well, I don't know about 10 digit exchanges, but we may have a phone number. Um, so here is my international phone number, and it's four digits followed by another four digits. So if I were to use my strict domestic US phone number, this wouldn't match because it's saying, well, it's three digits followed by three digits. So somebody asks, what does the star do? So star, so somebody's asking about star. This is exactly what the star does. So star is says zero or more repetitions of that character. So if I say digit star hyphen digit star, that means zero or more digits followed by a hyphen followed by zero or more digits. So this is what allows, so this is the key to regular expressions being able to match an infinite set of possible sequences. So with just alternation and sequence, I can, only, I can only specify a finite number of possible matches. With clean star, well, okay, this is called clean star or repetition, this star allows us to match zero or any number of digits. So, da so it's, it's not just slash D, it's slash D star. So let, let's, do some, let's do some simpler examples of this. So if I have a, uh, well, some of the classic examples people use. So let's say I have C, A star, T. What are, so list out all of the patterns, uh, list out all of the characters that match, list all of them. <laughs> So you guys are missing a bunch here. So you forgot the one where it's, you know, four A's, which matches, you, forget, you know, five A's. So let's list all of them. So that it's an infinite number of them. There's an infinite number of strings here. Does CT work? That's a good question. CT works because star means zero or more, zero or more instances, repetitions of the um, sequence that you're matching. So somebody asked, because, okay. Okay, so here's a, here's a tricky one. So if I say C, A, B in parentheses, star, what are all the sequences? What are all the characters that match this? So C, T matches. C, A, B, T, good. So C, A, B, T. What about C, A, A, T? The C, A, A, T match. C, A, A, T does not match because it has to be A, B, repeated over and over and over again. C-A-B-T. What about C-A-B-A-T? Yeah, okay, I, th I think you guys got the, uh, I think you guys got the, got the point here. Okay, so somebody asked, what if you added a pipe between A and B? So this is a good question. So this is a completely different pattern that we're matching here. This is saying that match C followed by parentheses means A or B, and then repeat that A or B sequence zero or more times followed by T. So what are some examples that match? Yeah, CBT, CBBT, CABAT, so basically A or B star means any sequence of A or B in any order, because you're saying A or B followed by A or B followed by A or B followed by A or B. Cool, okay, yeah. So regular expressions are implemented in all over the place. So they're, you know, if you use control F, some, a lot of IDs will allow you to do regular expression syntax, Perl style or AT&T style, Unix style, regular expression syntax. All right, that's repetition. So we already talked about optional elements um, so wild cards, you probably heard about wild cards. Wild cards um, just allow, 
so if I want to say, if I say C dot T, this means C followed by any ASCII character followed by T. Confusingly, on the command line, star is used as wildcard, whereas in regular expression, star is used as uh, zero more, clean star, zero more repetitions. So to make this ultra confusing, if I say C dot star T, this means C followed by any sequence of characters followed by T. Yeah, it also can be called clean closure, star closure, star, clean star. They all have the same name. So clean, clean is actually a cleany or cleana or something. This is the, the guy who kind of first described this or invented this. A, he was a formal math guy. So it's not actually not clean. So if I want to like match the name clean, you know, it's not going to match the word, the English word clean. Uh, but okay, anyway, so that's clean star. So yeah, dot is not, yeah, this is, this is really confusing. So this is where we have to wrap our head around the meta language versus the language. The notion of regular expressions can be described in formal math. Uh, it's these notions of alternation sequence and closure or clean star. But how we express that, the notation we express that, we need to describe, a we need a language to express it. And so unfortunately, in some classes in discrete, star will still be clean star, but dot means concatenation. But in most regular expression tools in industry and in real world tools, dot means any character. Dot is actually syntactic sugar for, um, for this, an alternation between any, any, any ASCII code. That is what dot means or yeah, that is what wildcard means. So for instance, slash D is equivalent to saying this. Make sense? So if I want to match a sequence of three characters, this regular expression works for that as well. I... Uh, I, I wouldn't think of it like git add dot. Dot in file systems, Unix file systems means current directory. So yeah, this is like, this is why it's crucial to have a spe very specific definition of the notation you're using. This is actually what compilers are all about. Compilers are all about making a rigorous definition of a language that has no ambiguity, where you, you can't have, a, mis have a, a, a mistake where you put a dot and you, you know, say you're, you're writing a program for, you know, a car and you have some specification of the operation of that car. You don't want an, any ambiguity into what some input into that car means because you don't want, you know, you don't want to crash into that car. So you, and this also goes back to just specification versus implementation in general. Languages themselves need a specification in order to have a, an unambiguous way to, to describe that specification and implement it specifically. It's just really tricky because specifications themselves, we need languages to describe them. So this is where compilers come into play, where we have specifications of specifications and compiler compilers. Okay, so I think this is a, a really good um, overview of regular expressions. And in the, you know, the next half, we'll talk about how these are actually implemented, the mental model, um, so before, before we go, we have, uh, well, let's say we have a couple minutes because so I was late. Let me just kind of go over regular expressions formally. So there are three operations in regular languages or regular expression languages. Concatenation and in, in programmer tools, this is just done by putting these characters next to each other, just like multiplication. Think of multiplication. Or on multiplication, we can just put the two numbers next to each other or the two symbols and a number next to each other, and it means multiplication. Uh, you know, as long as you have like three X. If you put three, three, that means the number 33. Alternation is done with a pipe, and clean closure is done with a star. And, you know, we saw this in practice a great deal. Uh, we saw that parentheses can be used to enforce order of operations. And I also want to say that here, 
this is also the order of precedence in reverse order. So clean closure has the highest order of precedence, followed by alternation, followed by concatenation. Think plus for concatenation, multiplication for alternation, and think exponent for clean closure. Exponent binds the tightest, has the highest precedence out of those three. Multiplication, second highest, plus third highest. Um, okay, any other questions, any questions on regular expressions? Uh, so, oh yeah, so one last thing. So one really crucial point here is that all of these, so where's the syntax here? All of the fancy syntax for regular expressions All the stuff we looked at, like dot and slash d, there's all sorts of other um, notation, like express one or more with plus, or you can use a question mark to mean zero or one. All of these, all of these, um, oh, where is it? So sorry, I did not have this prepared ahead of time. Okay, so all of these special notational tricks, like star plus question mark, all of these can be specified with just these three operators. You only need these three operators to specify any possible regular expression. So slash D can be specified with alternation. One or more characters can be specified using sequence of uh, one followed by zero or more clean star. So one thing, if you know, you learn this in discrete, but one thing to take away is that regular expressions, you only need these three operators to do any regular expression. All the rest of it is just syntactic convenience. Yeah, the homework, I'll, um, I'll talk about the homework. Uh, yeah, you use, use these, I, I give a little um, notes on the notation here. So you can use those for the regular expression, regular expressions. All right, let's, um, yeah, this, this is much more common in, in actual tools. It's a little unfortunate that, I don't know, yeah, I would, I would notice in, in previous classes where people would use dot for concatenation. This is a, a little unfortunate when it comes to real world tools because dot means, dot means any character. And it can be, it can be ultra confusing. Uh, there's also, you know, you also need to match, you know, parentheses. So to actually match the parentheses, you know, you escape it. This is, since you're familiar with C, this is, this is, um, I think, much more comfortable to use this Perl or, or Python, uh, you know, library syntax for these regular expressions. All right, questions on regular expressions. Before we take a break. And so just remember that for any regular expression, you only need these three operators and that's it. All the other fancy syntax that you see uh, can be expressed with this. Because the only kind of exception is like, um, there, are, uh, there is notation for saying, you know, beginning of input, end of input. Those are not actually part of the string you're matching. Those are, those are um, instructions to the regular expression tool about where you wanna start, how often you wanna match. Yeah, so plus means one or more, but plus can be specified. Plus is, so if I want to say one or more A, so A plus is one or more A's, but I can just say A, A star. Or if I want to say A or B, zero or more A or B's, I can say A or B followed by A or B star. That's equivalent to saying A or B plus. It's identical. It's just syntactic sugar. Okay, let's, um, so yeah, I was late, sorry. So I went over a little bit by five minutes. Let's take a um, 10 minute break. I'll answer questions for a couple minutes and then let's reconvene at 1130. So star is zero more, plus is one or more. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. So for the homework that I give you, uh, I, I'm restricting you to only using those three <clears throat> uh, core regular expression operators. although there's actually nothing in the homework that requires one or more. But, but yeah, you only need those three operators for regular expressions. All the other stuff is syntactic sugar or instructions to the regular expression engine.
Um, yeah, regular expressions are super, super useful. Uh, if you're familiar with Python, I, you know, I, I recommend using that. So somebody asked about the toy compiler. Is the assembly language generated x86? Yes. It's x86 assembly in ATT syntax. There are multiple syntaxes for specifying assembly language. There's the two main ones are Intel and AT&T syntax. And GCC, because of its Unix history, uses the ATT syntax, which is also what the toy compiler is using. So somebody tried to run their generated code in an online assembler and it wouldn't work. Well, you have the Vagrant virtual machine to actually compile it. You can use GCC to, to assemble your assembly code. It'll call the assembler for, assembler for you. If it didn't work, it may have been that it required Intel syntax. You know, check to, check to make sure, look at the example. If you see, so Intel versus ATT syntax. Yeah, you can see the differences here. So if you see brackets, it's probably Intel syntax. If you see parentheses, you, 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 it's probably AT&T syntax. Now those, those don't necessarily mean that they, I mean the, the semantics is not identical. It's not a one for one mapping between the two. But yeah, generally if you see brackets, it's probably Intel. And if you see parentheses, it's probably AT&T. Could that, could that be the issue for the, the person who asked? So office hours, you just join and you're in. Yeah, that's it. You just tried, yeah, just, yeah just, just use GCC because it's, you have all the tooling available for you on the command line. So this is, this is office hours. That's it. You just go in and then you're in. You're in this little virtual world. And it'll automatically create a video chat when our avatars are in close proximity. Um, it's, I, I chose this platform for one, there are some academic conferences that are starting to use this, which gave, made me familiar. And secondly, because of because it's like a physical, you know, it's because it's a kind of modeling a, two, a physical space in a 2D plane. Uh, students can line up, they can talk amongst themselves in a, in a corner, which students of, often do. You can talk to each other while waiting. Reminds you of Pokemon. Yeah, the, the avatars are kind of like, you know, these classic uh, 2D overhead, overhead games. But if, if somebody joins, if your avatar is, you know, if somebody is in proximity, it'll fire up a, a group video chat with those who are uh, in proximity to each other. So if there's a bunch of people over here, then they won't be part of the group chat here. So I just figured this might more, slightly more approximate how I see office hours work in person. Yeah, I think there might be a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so people will just kind of line up. Uh, well, people will just have to kind of line up just, just like in a physical, physical space. Yeah, there might be a lot of people for the for the toy compiler grading, but really for the toy compiler, um, and actually a lot of things in programming, you don't need someone to tell you whether you got it right. There's a physical machine that you can observe and watch and see if the behavior is what you expect. So for the toy compiler, you can just run make and it'll build, and then you can, and then if it doesn't build, then you copied something incorrectly. And if it makes, then you can run it and see if um, semantically the program works correctly. So yeah, just come to office hours. There may have been a mistake in the grading script or some network issue. Now, somebody asked about GCC being only a C compiler. Um, GCC will actually um, yeah, GCC is the, the C compiler, although now it, it used to be called the GNU C compiler. Now it's the GNU compiler collection because there's more than just C compilers. But GCC is a kind of a, a driver tool that will not just compile, but will call the linker, will call the assembler. So, so if you look back to, I think it was lecture two, where I walk you through how a program becomes, uh, you know, a source code becomes an executable. 
the compiler just turns the source code into target assembly language. It doesn't do any of the linking necessary or even the assembly. Assembly is taking the text of the assembly and turning it into machine code. And the linker uh, does the, you know, in the right object file format and the linker combines multiple files together, links with the runtime. And GCC will call out to all the, to call out to those tools. It'll actually just literally call the linker tool. I think the GCC compiler and many compilers are able to generate machine code in the right format. Uh, but yeah, GCC, you know, when you're running GCC, you're actually doing more than just compiling. You're, you're linking, uh, assembling and linking as well. We'll talk about context-free grammars uh, next week. But it's a way, it's basically like regular expressions. It specifies patterns of um, uh, grammars. It's, it's able to specify grammars. And grammars are like regular expressions, except you can specify hierarchy, hierarchical relationships between the language constructs. We'll talk about that next week. So how to tackle the assignment. I would take a look at the toy compiler compiler, the Bison Flex version of the toy compiler and see how that works. Wrap your head around that. That's I think the best way to, to start with that because that's a complete implementation of something very similar that you need to do for project one. The to do is you're really just calling the AST functions um, let me, let me get the assign, uh, project up here. You really just need to, I mean, here's an example of, of uh, here's an example of filling in the to do's. You're really just using the right API to create the corresponding AST node for the grammar construct that, we're, that you're parsing and filling in the right semantic values from the uh, child uh, elements of the grammar construct. From my understanding, we should perform, so somebody asking about project one, perform checks if the input is null. Oh, so you, you don't have to do that. So if you see, if you look at the, hopefully I wrote this. Oh, so I, I, okay, I probably, yeah, so this, this is, this is basically done for you, the exit one, the exit codes. So you don't have to worry about exit codes. So, so any point to write any exit two, so this is implemented for you. Exit two is implemented for you. So the input, input handling is handled by Flex and Bison for you already. The yeah, office hours are at normal time today. Um, if you look at the lecture notes, so if a person is asking about Bison syntax, look at the lecture notes for um, where am I here? Look at the lecture notes from um, last time. And is it here? So you can you can just look for Bison. There's a there's a website that has all of the info, the manual for Bison. You uh, for for lists. So if you look at the lecture for lists, so yeah, watch the lecture again because I go I implement some of the constructs for you. For lists, you want to make the empty list set the semantic value to null uh, because that's the end of the list. So there are places where you define the semantic value to be null. But yeah, watch the end of the um, last lecture. I think it was the last lecture.
Yeah. <clears throat> so this is more for debugging. If you're if you're getting problems in your input and you want to be really kind of pedantic, you can add null checks um, in you know wherever wherever you're creating AST nodes. I mean, actually, I, I don't maybe I failed to mention this, but the AST API already has these null checks for you. I put them in there, so you'll you'll get a warning. You'll get you know an expected error. The program will terminate and say you have a null in this in this grammar construct. Okay. <clears throat> Sure, my iPad's set up. Somebody mic, somebody's mic on. Do you need to say something? Or it was a mistake. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. Let, uh, so welcome back. It's already eleven thirty-two. Let's let's move on to the second half of the discussion on regular expressions and finite state machines. Okay, in the first half we looked at regular expressions. So let's take a look at the uh, a new model of computation that is used to actually implement regular expressions. So I think if you've taken discrete two, you've you've probably seen this already. Finite state automata. These have many many names: finite state machines, finite automaton, state machine. Um, they're all they all mean the same thing. And so the intuition behind this is that this kind of pattern matching is equivalent to a whole bunch of automation tasks. Intuitively, the way we, the way we um, do this pattern matching is we capture every possible string prefix that our pattern specifies. So imagine, you know, you could write out on a piece of paper every possible uh, partial string that matches and assign a state to that. So let me, um, let me, well, okay, yeah. Just imagine assigning a state to that. And then the pattern matching task is just reading one character at a time and transitioning between those states. So that's the core of what a, a finite state machine does. So let me uh, get it, let, let me just get in, let me just get into the, um, slides for this. So I'm using my previous slides for this that I've already created. Okay. So let me give an example of this, this notion of a state machine. So this is, I just took this from Wikipedia. But we think of, uh, maybe this is an antiquated example, but I mean, I think you all have gone, gone through turnstiles before. And um, so how does a turnstile work if you have like a key card or a token that you need to put in? Well, the turnstile is either locked or unlocked. And there, so there's two possible states of this turnstile. And there are several possible inputs to the turnstile. So there's the key card or coin that you put in to the turnstile. And there's also pushing the turnstile. So as you know, if you push the turnstile and the turnstile is locked, then nothing's going to happen. The, the turnstile is going to stay locked. So if the turnstile is in this locked state and you push on it, well, it's just going to stay in the locked state. So we can represent that as a transition from the locked state back to the locked state where the input is we push on the turnstile. Now, if we put a coin in the machine or we swipe our card, that puts the machine into the unlocked state. And um, if we push on that turnstile in the unlocked state, it's gonna let us through and then return this machine to the locked state again. Make sense? So, so we can model this as a machine that has two possible states and two possible inputs. And we, we um, explicitly define every possible transition between states given every possible input to that machine. Now this you know, sounds like it could be a very tedious task to do by hand and we'll see how we can automate this later. But you can imagine that you could sit down and you could specify every possible state of the machine 
and every possible input to that machine and every possible transition between states with every possible input. So getting some questions here. So somebody saying how new, I, um, I don't know what I was talking about then when I said new. Maybe uh, I meant new for this class. So quantum computing, so how would quantum compute the infinite automata? So I have no idea. I'm not an expert in quantum computing. I think quantum computing just allows you to superimpose states, uh, which makes certain algorithms faster to run. I think you get like um, speed ups versus any kind of additional states. I, I don't know if quantum computing allows infinite states. I think it, from what I understand, it allows you to superimpose multiple states and compute on multiple states at the same time, but I, um, I'm not an expert in that, I don't know. So it's non-deterministic. So we'll get into non-deterministic versus deterministic in a second, in a little bit. Um, but let's just look. Let's just look um, at. Let's just look at automata first, finite state automata first. But okay. So any questions on this? So one one th point is is that we need to specify all possible inputs on all possible states. So for this machine, this designer is just like, well, if you put in more coins or you swipe your card again, it's just going to return to the unlocked state. Now, if you were actually a user, you would want to be like, well, well, why are you stealing my money? I put in multiple coins, it should unlock twice. And if you go to like a subway or something, they'll actually account for that. But in a simple two state model, just locked and unlocked, these are all the possible states, all the possible inputs and all the possible transitions between all possible states. Are these related to cellular automata? Um, actually, yes. I'm also not an expert on that, but I, yeah, there's, so there's, very, there's, there's many kinds of automata. These finite state machines are a very specific kind of automata and they have a specific set of problems that they can work on and a specific set of limitations. So automata theory is a, a, is a whole subfield in computer science. Um, basically just talking about states and inputs and how states transition, how you transition between states on, on those inputs. For this class, so take discrete to learn more about the theory of automata all the way up to um, Turing machines, which, which um, are the model that are used for you know, general purpose computing. But in this class, we're only gonna look at the automata needed for lexing regular expressions and parsing grammars. So, okay, but let's start, you know, let's start small with just finite state automata. Uh, so these, as we'll, as we'll see, they actually correspond one for one to regular languages. So remember, regular languages are those pattern, uh, sets of strings that can be specified using regular expressions. Those three operations, alternation, concatenation, and clean closure, or clean star, or star, star closure. And it turns out that this model of computation, this finite state machine model, corresponds one for one for regular expressions. So what does that mean? That means that we can take a regular expression, which is just you know, a notational convenience almost for identifying patterns of strings. And if we can make and find the corresponding finite state machine, we can just implement a machine that automatically does this pattern recognition. Kind of amazing, right? We, we take this purely textual notation that specifies strings and because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between that and finite state machines, if we can find that finite state machine, well, then we just implement that in hardware or software, and voila, we've got a machine that, that recognizes any string in that regular expression language. So there's all sorts of applications of these finite state machines. I think in maybe old school engineering or electrical engineering, actually probably currently still as well, for like really, you can actually hand build an electrical device that implements a state machine. So for instance, old vending machines apparently before, and I'm, I'm guessing now they're computerized, digitized, but old vending machines would, I, apparently according to like textbooks, they would operate um, using some built-in state machine, either a mechanical or electrical state machine where they'd have one state for each quantity of money that the um, user has inserted so far. So they'd have a, so that, you know, the states would be how much money you've put in and the inputs would be different sizes of coins or different denominations of coins. And so the starting state would be zero, would represent zero dollars or zero cents put in. 
And then you'd have a transition from that for each denomination of coin that you put in. So if you put in a penny, it would go to a state that represents one cent. If you put in a nickel, it would go to a state that represents five cents. And then from the five cent state, you'd have a transition from each possible coin that goes out. Okay, yeah, good. So you saw the, so some people saw the vending machine examples. That's a classic example of a, of a state machine. And so, you know, the state machine is this abstract model where you have states, inputs, transition between states <clears throat> and an accept state. Uh, but, but, you know, from our point of view as programmers, you, you, you know, what, what, several weeks ago, this, this um, mindset I wanted to, to help you to help foster here is that, you know, the C model of a machine where you have random access memory and you basically have branching and, and testing that memory and updating that memory, that's in some sense one model of, of programming. It's, it's very close to the actual physical machine, which makes it important to, to learn and understand. But, it's, but in terms of the model of computation, it's only one way to think about computation. Another way to think about computation is we define a bunch of states that we want the machine to be in. We define the inputs to that machine and we define transitions between those states. And of course, as we'll see in this lecture, you can actually automate the translation between these models of computation, or at least between less, power, um, less powerful to more powerful models of computation. Okay, questions on finite state machines kind of intuitively or generally. It's just, you just outline each possible state that the machine can be in. You outline all the possible inputs that it can have, or at least all the possible um, uh, L, um, input tokens or input strings L, or input characters, the, the language of, uh, or the alphabet of inputs that can go to the machine and then transitions between the machine. Okay, so we'll get to this a little more next time, but this notion of so, so what, what I find amazing about, about all of this compiler work and languages in general is that, you know, we just use regular expressions, but behind the scenes, what's going on is this, is this correspondence between the regular languages, the languages that regular expressions define, and a model of computation, finite state machines. And so this is actually a, a, a larger um, correspondence between languages and machines and computation that all of these various models of, or at least there's a, there's a hierarchy of stronger and stronger models of computation that correspond to models of language that are in increasingly more complex or that are increasingly more uh, expressive. And so it's not just regular languages that regular expressions specify correspond to finite state machines, but there are actually more expressive languages like context-free languages or context-free grammars that specify more structure in the language. And those correspond to another kind of automata, pushdown automata. We'll talk about that next week a little bit. Uh, and then there's, you know, there's going up this hierarchy, there's this correspondence between Turing machines, which are considered to be the, you know, the, the general computation, the most computation that these, these digital machines can do. As, that's the hypothesis by Church and, Church and Turing. And a correspondence in, between that and the definition of language that um, Chomsky pointed out, discovered several decades ago. And this correspondence is, is interesting because we can write a language definition like a grammar or a regular language, and we can automatically translate it or automatically compile it into a machine that will automatically recognize that language. This is why regular expressions work. This is why you can say a regular expression and have it automatically um, compiled into a program that recognizes that language. So this is kind of a cool, from a philosophical perspective, this is, I mean, for me, this is kind of fascinating that there's this correspondence between language, or at least our, our formal understandings of language in the kind of Chomsky cognitive science world and computation, these models of computation that were actually independently um, in a lot, and, and sometimes independently discovered and the correspondence was made later. Okay, so as I mentioned, finite automata to find state transitions. And the, uh, there are several ways to represent a finite state machine. In textbooks and in, and in academic talks in class, we'll use this kind of graphical model where we use circles for states, labeled arrows where, for transitions where the label is the input that we see. 
we have a starting state, just some in arrow, and accepting states, we use double circles. So, so let me show you an example of this. So our flex lexer, or our tor compiler lexer, well, actually, the tor compiler didn't have identifiers, but the, the flex uh, lexer for simple C needs to be able to recognize a sequence of, of characters as being an identifier in our language. Uh, and so in C and simple C in lots of languages, so Mealy and more, I don't know much about the Mealy and more. I think these do correspond to finite state machines, one of them. I don't remember which is which. This is often talked about in electrical engineering, uh, but I would just look that up on Wikipedia. I think one of them actually is, is the finite state machine, but I, I can't remember. I, I, never learned, I never learned this. I think the engineers learned, learned the, uh, the, those namings of these machines. Uh, but okay, so in C and simple C, identifiers are usually defined to be, in many languages, they're defined to be some uh, letter followed by any number of letters or digits. And so, so why is this? If we allowed any character, then you know, we'd, we'd start clashing with punctuation. If we allowed any letter or digit, then we may have trouble distinguish between, distinguishing between numbers and identifiers in our language, at least doing a single pass read over each character of the input. And so what we do for identifiers is we can specify, well, actually, let's do a little exercise. And, and, and let me ask you if, um, well, actually, I don't know. I don't know the syntax for, well, anyway, we don't have to do it with, with, with um, Python. But if, if, say, slash L is letters, although it's not in, in Perl syntax, I don't remember what it is, actually. Maybe it's slash W. Let me just look it up real quick. Any alphanumeric character? Well, we'd have to use a character class to do it. Okay, so, well, let me ask you guys. So how, what would the regular expression be for, let, let's say this is, this is the, this means any um, letter, and this means any digit slash D. So how would we write a regular expression that matches an identifier where it's any sequence of letters or digits, but the first one has to be a, the first one has to be a, um, a letter. So how would we write that regular expression? I just use control F in Firefox. So somebody said, letter followed by digit or letter star. So this is extremely hard to read. The one in the chat is probably a little easier to read, but this is basically just saying any letter followed by this parenthesized expression, which says any digit or any letter and that pattern can happen zero or more times. So if I've got just a, and let me, let me match. Uh, uh, so unfortunately, I don't know how to make this bigger. So sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know how I, I zoom into this. I, maybe there's some operating system thing I can, I can do. Sorry about that. So if I just have a sequence of digits here, it's not going to match. If I have a sequence of digits or letters that starts with a, a digit, then it's not going to match. So I need to have some sequence of digits and letters that starts with a letter. So this is actually the regular expression that is used by many compilers to read in a, an identifier token or, or even a keyword token. And the, from a state machine, dia, state machine point of view, we can specify that very same language and that very same regular expression using a state machine where we have a state nine here in this case, which means we haven't seen anything yet. 
state 10 means we've seen a single letter and we, oh, I'm sorry, state 10 means we've seen a single letter or we've seen, um, we've seen a complete identifier. And state 11 means we've seen a complete identifier followed by some other character. So let me, let me walk through this again. So if we're in state nine, that means we haven't seen anything in the input yet. When we see the first letter in the input, say we're reading in A1 is our identifier. Then when we see A, we transition from state nine to state 10. And then when we see the number one, we follow the transition from state 10 back to state 10, because this transition diagram, the finite state machine says, once you're in state 10, if you see a letter or a digit there, I mean, really strictly speaking, this would be two transitions or actually one transition for each possible character. So you'd have a transition for zero, one, two, three, four, all of them. And all those would just transition back to state 10. And, and so you'll notice that in, um, in these state machines, we'll see this in a second, that concatenation is basically just a transition from one state to a different state. Clean star is a transition, uh, a certain, like a, um, a cycle in this state machine if we view this as a directed graph. And alternation is two inputs that go to two different states. So somebody's asking, do the numbers matter? I'm not sure what you mean by number, like the numbers labeling each point. Oh no, the numbers don't matter. These are just to identify the states. This is purely graphical. So these, these numbers are just naming the states. And, but the states represent, at least for, for string input, they represent different valid prefixes of the inputs of the strings that are represented by the regular language. So somebody asked, would epsilon count as other? So we'll, we'll get to epsilon in a second. So other here is not well-defined. This is from the dragon book, but they mean another character. They don't mean epsilon. They don't mean empty string. This is a little bit of a shorthand, a, a, a strict, uh, like a, the actual like ASCII based table or ASCII based graph would have one edge for every possible ASCII character. Uh, but this is just, this is just a kind of, uh, to make it a little simpler to write. Yeah, other would be any, any other ASCII character. So we're not gonna worry too much about, you know, the, it's a little tedious to think about how Alexa is actually built. You know, they need to actually have a look ahead character. And it's a, it's a little more um, tedious to, to work out. So here's a much more complex one for numbers. So this is, uh, well, okay. So here's a little, <laughs> here's a little exercise. So before I even go into this, I'm gonna give you this as an exercise to write, um, write, a, write a string that this state machine matches. So I'll give you, give you a minute or two to work through this. You may, you may if, you're, if you're clever, you may notice a sort of easy, you know, uh, kind of easy way to, to do it. Well, not that easy. <laughs> Okay, so remember the double circle. So sorry. So the double circle means an accept state. So I didn't go into this too much, but accept state. Uh, in order for the the match to be recognized, the accept state you must reach the accept state in your state machine. E. Oh yeah, E is epsilon. All right. So th this is too hard. So I I didn't talk about. Uh, oh no no E is not epsilon. Sorry, E is not epsilon. E is the character E. So like in C, C numbers, you can actually, uh, I think in C, you can put an E for an X, or not in C. Some languages allow you to put E for an exponent, to explicitly put the exponent. So somebody's writing the regular expression, which is, which is great. But I was just asking, can you write a, a number, a string that, that this matches? So the regular expression is close, although you use zero or more instead of one or more. So, so okay, so here's one. So let's look, I'm gonna read the simpler one because somebody, so eight, yeah, so eight matches the, so eight transitions from 12 to 13, dot transitions from 13 to 14, six transitions from 14 to 15, seven transitions 
from 15 to 15. E should be capital E, but I think that was just a minor mistake. E capital E transitions from 15 to 16, plus transitions from 16 to 17, and five transitions from 17 to 18. And then as long as there's another character of the input, including end of input character, which is why the toy compiler had EOF as a token, uh, as long as there's an end, an end of input, some other character, then we'll reach 19 in the accept state. So good, good. And so a lot of these other ones look correct as well. So very good. So what about, um, what about just the number one, the digit one, followed by EOF or some other character? So we have the digit one here and then EOF or some other character reaches state 20. 20 is also an accept state. So you can have multiple accept states. What is the star next to 20 and 21? I don't know, actually. I'd have to look, look, go back and look at the Dragon Book. I'm not sure. They probably had a little note. I, I think it's not related to the specification of the finance state machine. I think it's a note that they had. They were, they were probably saying something about it, but I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's not clean star. Yeah, it's not clean star. What triggers state 13 to go back to 13? So seeing a digit in the input. So think of digit here as being one edge for every possible digit. So zero, one through blah, 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 blah. So, it's, so the digit triggers one uh, state transition from 13 to 13. But yeah, if, if we think of from regular expressions and from the language definition point of view, this is a clean closure, a clean star. This is how you can, this is what it looks like in state machine. Okay, um, let's do an example of a state machine for, before we look at uh, non-determinism. Let's look at one of these guys here, okay. So let, let's, let's try this together, let's try a or B star followed by ABB. Now it's a little tricky because I can't see you write anything, but how would, okay, so let's, so we, we always need a starting state. So this let's, and we don't need to even label it. Well, I'll, I'll label these with letters to make it a little less, oh no, that's more confusing. I'll label these with numbers. So we always have some starting state. Uh, okay, so how can we represent, um, how can we represent the state for, okay, so first of all, in this A or B star, what's the order of operations here? Which operation happens, has higher precedence here, the star or the or? Uh, it was a little bit of a trick question because remember the parentheses, just like in arithmetic, if you had A, you know, one plus two, parentheses exponent, you would do the, the addition first. So the parentheses here mean the or happens first. So how can we use this state machine? And I know I'm sort of putting you on the spot, but how can we use the state machine to represent this or operation in our regular expression? Okay, good. There's two arrows leaving state one. And remember, they need labels to say what, what input causes that transition. So A and B, good. So A and B cause transitions to some other states. So let's just name them state two and state three. Okay, so now it gets a little tricky. We need to express the fact that there can be um, zero or more of these. Okay, so both states two and three have both A and B going back to them because this is the clean star part. Oops, that was weird. Okay, okay, good. So now, uh, okay, so what about the, this concatenation with A? This is where it gets a little tricky. They merge, so what does that mean? What merges? 
two and three merge? Well, two and three are separate states because they're reached by two different inputs. We would have one arrow A or B, both go to state four when they hit an A. Okay, that's interesting. So if they hit an A, but remember, we already have, we've already got a, we've already got a transition from A, from three to three, and from two to two, if we see an A. So we've kind of locked ourselves in already here by, uh, by making this decision. A or B would point to the same state. So instead of, so you're saying instead of looping back, so instead of two going to two, we'd have two go to four and three go to four on A and B. Is that right? That person who said that? Okay, so let's, let's try that. Oh, it'll go to, all right, it's a little difficult over chat. But the, the main problem here is that because this is a clean star, we need to capture the fact that not only is there an alternate choice here, but it's possible that this is zero characters here. But what's tr really tricky is that the, an A, an input A could either be matching an A here or it's matching this one. We don't know the difference until we see more of the input. We don't know the difference. So this state two here has to capture the fact that we could either be in the state where we, we could, yeah, we could either be in the input where th it's a prefix to this um, pattern or it's this pattern. Okay, so one, two, so the, the, or I mean, the real problem here is that if we only have one possible transition for each input from a state, we've already defined a complete, we've already defined all possible transitions of this state machine. So if, if these were, so say we, these were the accept states, what's the regular expression? What's the regular expression that this finite state machine matches? Okay, so we have some, some answers here. So A or B star. So remember A or B, so, okay, is that right? So, ah, good, okay. So yeah, it's A or B followed by A or B star. Because A or B star allows, no in, allows empty input to be accepted. But remember, we start on state one, but it's not an accept state. So this, if this is an accept state, means we have to have some A or B first before we, um, can accept this input. So that means that the input, the regular expression, accounts for that by saying one or more A or B. Okay, so it's, it's hard. I mean, I don't, I mean, I'd have to sit here a while and actually figure out a way to, to write this machine. It's kind of a pain. So to make it, so, so uh, yeah, having, um, so talking about non-determinants like finite automata is often really confusing for students. But I think this example motivates the rationale for adding non-determinism into state machines. Okay, so remember we talked about this notion of epsilon and epsilon matches an empty state. In state machines, we can make a, an epsilon input. So instead of having just this finite automaton where there's one transition for each state, it has to be some one input causes one transition between two states. Instead, we can allow for non-determinism. Basically, we allow for the machine to be in multiple states at the same time. That's all non-determinism means. Determinism means the state machine is only in one state at a time. And for a physical device, this, this makes sense. We can't, uh, we, we wouldn't be able, we'd have to make multiple devices or somehow um, have, you know, record multiple states at the same time physically. And in software, this is, you know, not so hard to simulate. But for building some physical device, we have to build basically multiple devices that store the state, multiple physical things that store, um, store each state. Uh, but from a formal point of view, allowing this kind of non-determinism actually makes this correspondence between regular expressions and finite state machines 
a lot easier to reason about. Okay, so a, fi a, a non deterministic finite state machine, as I mentioned, allows a machine to be in multiple states at the same time. So one way to be in multiple states at the same time is through epsilon transitions. Remember, epsilon, as we hinted at before, means an empty string. So if I have an epsilon transition from, and I can also have multiple transitions with the same, with the same character. But if I have an epsilon transition, uh, well, actually, let, let, let's, let's not talk about multiple states at the same time. If I have an epsilon transition from state one to state two, it doesn't just mean that we always transition to state two because uh, you know an empty input, we can always match an empty input on the input. So no matter what, no matter what the input is, we can always match this transition from one to two. But more importantly, this means that we're in both state one and state two at the same time. Because you can match an infinite number of epsilons. You can match no epsilons in your input. So this is getting a little bit, uh, yeah. So this is gonna, you're gonna stretch your brain a little bit here. So we have to reason about being in multiple states at the same time. But this actually is convenient. If you can wrap your head around this, this actually being it really convenient to translate regular expressions into these state machines. Okay, so let, let me um, write out, is it like multi-core processing? Yes, it's like multi-core processing, except in, with physical devices, we have a finite limitation on the number of uh, simultaneous states we can be in. In the theoretical world, we can have an arbitrary number of, of states, an infinite number if, if we want. Non-deterministic, these finite state machines have a finite number of states, so the maximum number of simultaneous states they can be in is also finite. But if we have a, you know, a million state machine, conceptually, we can, we can imagine that every possible um, combination of states is possible at any one time. You can also think about it as point, splitting one pointer into multiple pointers. I'm not sure what you mean by a pointer. Well, but quantum computing also has a, doesn't it also have a finite number of states that these things can be in? I think there's still a finite number of, of states. Um, but yeah, yeah, in quantum computing, you can, yeah, you can be in multiple states at the same time. And as we'll see in a second, that you can actually model, as long as you have a finite number of states, you can always model it with a uh, deterministic determinism. But let's look at that in a second. Okay, so yeah, we just have to wrap our head around this fact that when we follow this machine to do pattern matching, we're allowed to be in multiple states at the same time. For this case of, for this example, this is actually a really convenient thing for us uh, because we can also allow multiple transitions on the same character. So before, well, okay, let's start where we left off before. Let's start where we left off. We, we had a machine where we started in state one and we transitioned using A and B to states two and three. And we um, sensibly wrote that we can just keep repeating Uh, a or B from states two and state three. But the problem was that we weren't accounting for the fact that this is clean star. We might have zero or one. So one easy way to get around this is we can say, well, we could also just see an A that goes to some other state four to account for seeing this A here. You guys with me on this? Questions on that? Okay, so let's finish out. Let's finish out the. Uh, let's finish out this regular expression. So I think some some people were saying that once we're in state two, we have a transition from A to some other state, and from some state three, we also can have a transition from A to some other state six. Or actually, I think more compactly, students were saying, well, you know, it's it's actually the same state. It can be the same state. So what's next here? So now we've got a, uh, a state machine that represents this clean star here. Where we've got A or B, zero or more, or one or more A or Bs. And we also have skipping the clean star. 
Right, but this, this bottom end is for skipping the clean star. This is the zero part. Okay, so, we've, so we have a pattern, we have a state machine. Okay, so somebody's saying state three to state one. Well, what's the transition from state three to state one that you're imagining? Oh, it was a question. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So we, we've already got, well, it's, it's not whether it's allowed, it's whether it matches this, this input. So we've already got something that matches, uh, that matches this part, that matches the same thing that this regular expression matches. So we've got the, the one or more A or Bs here and the zero A's here. So four and five both point to six through B. Okay, so if we see a B, then we're in state six. And let's just finish this out by saying, if we see another B, we go to state seven and then we accept. So for those of you who are, who are a little lost, let me walk through a couple of example programs here, or example inputs. So let's say we've got a, B, B. What input is three's arrow, outgoing arrow? Oh, sorry about that, thank you. That's A. All right, so let's, let's, um, let's walk through this. So say we have A, B, B as our input. We start in state one. We see character A. So what states do we transition to when we see A from one? Exactly, we see two and four. So this is the non-determinism. We're actually in, this machine is in two states at the same time. So you just have to kind of believe that you can be in multiple states at the same time. So we're in state two and we're in state four. So now we're in state two and we're in state four. We go to the next character and input B. So we're in state two or in state four. What happens when we C, state B. So somebody says state two, somebody says state six. You're both right. So state two transitions back to state two. State four transitions to state six. So now we're in both state two and state six at the same time. So we see another B. What states do we go in now? So we're in state two, we're in state six, and we see another B. We go to state seven, and then we go to state seven. I'm sorry, we go to state two as well. So now we're in both state seven and state two. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll just tell you this, is that as long as you reach some, as long as one of the states you reach is an accepting state, then you've successfully matched. Uh, okay, good question. Two is not an accepting state. Two is not an accepting state. So for instance, if we just saw A, B as our input, we would reach state two and state six but neither of those states would be an accepting state. So we wouldn't have matched this regular expression. Yeah, the double circle means accepting state. So state, so yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, kind of like backtracking all these notions in computer science where you have a state space to explore and you need to explore all of them. Um, I'm wondering, you probably could use some kind of backtracking algorithm to do this as well. Uh, but, you know, just conceptually imagine instead of being in one state at any given time, you can be in multiple states and you just have to follow. I mean, it's basically like trying every possibility. I mean, it's this classic programming problem of, you know, exploring state spaces. But finite state machines give a, a nice, um, well-defined way to describe a specific restricted machine and what those states are and what those transitions are. So somebody's asking, can we remove certain states and make, you know, make this improvement? So yes, if you take discrete two and you read in the dragon book, there's a whole bunch of theorems about uh, having a, um, a minimal state machine. So it turns out that regular expressions, finite state machines, you can have many, many different regular expressions that all match the same set of strings, that all match the same language. And so this is also a principle in in like um, the computational linguistics that, and in grammars where you can have many, many grammars all matching the same language. Yes, yeah, so in a non-deterministic finite state machine, you can be in many states at once, 
including one that is an accept state. And as long as one of those states is an accept state, then that means you found one path, we found one set of transitions where the input takes that machine from the starting state to the accept state. And so that input matches your regular expression, that input matches, matches the regular expression. Even if all the other ones are not accepting states, they don't all have to be accepting states. And this kind of makes sense because if you had, were able to guess ahead the right path to take through the state machine, then you would have found some, uh, you know, cor uh, correctly matched um, string in that described by that regular expression. So pretty, pretty interesting, right? Pretty cool. And it turns out that thinking in this way makes it much easier to see the relationship between regular expressions and finite automata. Okay, so we'll, we'll see this in a second, but it turns out that not only can we represent regular expressions with these non-deterministic finite automata, but actually there's a correspondence, a one to, um, you know, a, uh, uh, correspondence between non-deterministic finite automata and deterministic ones. We can always make a deterministic finite automaton that is, it matches an equivalent language to a non-deterministic one. And that's going to be the, the second part of this and something that you're going to do for homework uh, is actually doing this conversion. And moreover, there's also a minimal deterministic finite automaton for any given language. So you can, even if you have a finite state machine that has tons and tons of states, so somebody said, can we remove these states and make a, a more optimal one, the one that has fewer states? Yes, and there are, there are, there are procedures for doing this. Yeah, we're gonna make an NFA, uh, to, yeah, we're gonna convert an NFA to a DFA. Okay, so uh, graphically and, and kind of mathematically, it's convenient to have this visual diagram. But when we go to implement this, uh, just like with regular expressions, we can implement this using, you know, if statements and while loops. But a, a nice, uh, another alternative representation of this is a table driven, uh, a table driven transition table or a table transition table that represents all of these state transitions. And these are really, really straightforward to write down. You just have one row for every state in your machine and you have one column for every possible input and the um, cell says, if you're in this state and you see input A, then the cell tells you the next state that you go to. So let's do a little, let's do a little exercise with this. I'll make a simpler, a simpler um, state machine here. So let's take our, our state machine for Oops, what am I thinking? Let's take this state machine that we kind of developed originally for just one or more A's and B's. Let's call this, okay, this is, uh, should I redraw this? My handwriting is really bad. <laughs> let, me, let me redraw it. So if I'm asking it, I should probably draw it. And I realize that I should actually use this feature of this tool to avoid having to have good handwriting. Much nicer. Uh, the numbering of the states doesn't matter. The numbering of the states is just, is, yeah, it's, it's purely uh, part of the meta language. It's just for you to refer, be able to refer to states. Ah, so, so nice. Not evenly centered. Should I go to the trouble of centering this? Okay, centered enough. Okay, so here's our state machine. Uh, this is a, an app called Notability. I, I, use, I use an iPad. I think the Apple, um, operating system now supports this kind of stuff natively or their notes tool. There's a bunch of tools that can do this, you know, automatic uh, shape recognition. I think OneNote does this as well. Okay, let's make a transition table out of this thing. So remember a transition table has every single possible state on a row 
and every single possible character that can be in the input on columns. All right, so if we're in, so state one is the starting state, state two and three are the accepting states. So if we're in state one, so remember the cell tells you the next state that you transition to if you're in that state and you see this in the input. So if we're on one A, if we're in state one and we see an A, what state do we transition to? Good, two. And if we're in, if we see B, what state do we transition to? Three, good. If we're in state two and we see A, what do we transition to? Two, good. And if we're in state two and we see B, it's two. And I think you guys uh, get the point here. Um, now I'm not gonna talk too much about dead states or error states. Technically speaking, if you have to have a trans, you know, you have a transition from every possible state uh, or if you have a transition from every state for every possible input. Uh, and for, for, the, for our purposes, if, um, if it doesn't go to an accepting state and never will, there's no transition, we just omit it. We, we don't need to draw it in our diagrams. So for this class, we don't have to worry about like dead states or the states that don't have, don't have uh, viable transitions. I think in discrete two, they'll have you draw them all to a single dead state, but don't worry about that. Don't worry about that in this class. Uh, and okay, and so for non-deterministic finite automata, automata uh, we can represent that by just having multiple states in the cell. So instead of a single state, you know, the main, you know, one, another way to look at the difference between deterministic and non-deterministic is that the transition table for a deterministic will only have one entry for each state input combination. A non-deterministic one will have multiple states. This is the specification of it, specification of it. Different from, you know, running the where you also have, you know, you also can be in multiple states at the same time. Questions on this so far, transition tables? Questions at all on finite state machines? So somebody mentioned like Pokemon before. I, I really, I strongly recommend this talk. This is, this is a really cool, um, this is a really cool talk. I won't, I won't have time to show it now, but I, I even jumped to the right section but can you guys hear this? Okay, good. Uh, but anyway, I would watch this because it basically shows that this entire game can be played correctly by uh, just writing a giant state machine. And this guy did it. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's your discrete two textbook. So real world application to real relevant stuff, playing games automatically that have a simple enough state. And basically any machine where you can, you can, um, whoa, what happened here? Any machine where you can list out every possible state that the machine can be in, you can model it with a finite state machine. And that, technically includes our physical devices because you have a finite amount of RAM. So it's a huge amount, but technically there's a finite number of states that that RAM can be in in the CPU. And so even though we use Turing machines to model computation, our physical machines, you know, without being able to add extra RAM arbitrarily are, um, are, are technically in a sense finite state machines. Okay, so there, I won't go over the math model of this too much, but you can look on Wikipedia, look in the Dragon Book, take discrete two, but they'll just describe it formally using you know Greek letters and stuff. Um, all right, let me go back to make sure I didn't miss anything in my slides. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so let's look at how we actually can go from, automatically go from a regular expression to a finite automata. So, so that, that table, that's one way that you can encode the state machine in a machine. You can also generate it as a series of while loops, um, if statements and while loops. So I won't go into that too much, the actual implementation on a machine. Read the Dragon Book, it's fairly straightforward it's fairly straightforward. You can even use a graph to do it. I mean, there, there's all sorts of ways to implement it. But as long as you have that transition table, you can imagine one way to write a pretty straightforward algorithm to just keep a single state, 
look up in the table, take the input, look up in the table, find the next state, look up in the table. Very, very simple iterative algorithm to do that. Uh, the, the subtle part is how do we go from a regular expression to an automata? This is a little bit more tricky and this is part of your homework. And so I would recommend reading the Dragon Book. There's also, I mean, this is a age old topic in computer science. So there's millions of videos on YouTube to do this. I'm just gonna kind of go through uh, one algorithm, show you an example. And in homework, you'll just do this once. Uh, this will be good prep for discrete two if you haven't taken it. And if you've taken discrete two, this maybe should be pretty easy. Okay, so let's look at Let's look at how we take a regular expression and turn it into a non-deterministic finite automaton. Yeah, we're gonna, we'll do the conversion today. We'll do the conversion today. Okay, so this is actually very much like a compiler. And I, I, hopefully I can give you the intuition behind this without going into too much detail. Technically the regular expression itself is a language and you need to make a parse tree out of it, a tree that's you know, like, like, a, like an arithmetic expression tree that preserves the order of operations so that you know which operation to do first. But I'm gonna see if we can do this a little bit intuitively. So, okay, so the way we think of this is, is that if we have, if we already have some regular, uh, some um, automaton for a regular expression, then if we wanna concatenate two regular expressions, we take the accept state of the first regular expression and we just make it the same as the initial state of the other regular expression. You with me on this? So a really simple example, if we've got a, well, okay, so first of all, a regular expression to just match the letter A would be this. Here's a regular expression that matches the letter A. And if we wanna concatenate that with a regular expression that matches the letter B, then we just take these two states and make them the same thing, make them the same state. We just line up the starting state with the ending state. Questions on this? Does this make sense? So the Dragon Book has this nice overlapping diagram to express this, where if some, you know, what they're, all they're saying is that a, we can kind of turn this into a little bit of a template where this oval means any, any other state where this is the initial state, this is the accepting state. And they overlap these ovals to mean we line up, we make the end state of one machine to be the starting state of another machine. All good on this. If you get this, I think the rest of it is, is a lot clearer. Any questions on this? Yeah, we're not doing we're not doing proofs. No proofs in this class for, for any of this stuff. We're just clients. We're users of this math theory, which is you know in, in week one I wanted why I wanted to get across that. You know, and it may seem a little. It's kind of like when you take math, it's like why would I ever need this? But these are like, um, you know, kind of abstractions that can be actually applied in many different ways in the real world. Right. So the end state of one machine is the starting state of another machine. So we assume that we've already, if we assume we are, yeah, it's, it's gonna be this kind of recursive procedure where you go over the, uh, the expression tree of the regular expression. But let's, you know, you basically just need to do the order of operations. And you, you it, we'll do an, I'll do an example just to show you what this means. Okay, so this is how we can do alternation in a, so these are just pattern, these are just uh, kind of uh, easy patterns for making this conversion systematic. These aren't necessarily the optimal ones, but these are like really simple, the simple ways to do it. So if we've already got two expressions like A and B, like a, the, the, the match for A, the machine to match B, then we can implement alternation by using this epsilon transition. So epsilon just basically says, we're gonna be in both of these starting states at the same time. Make sense, make sense so far? So we just take, take the two machines that we already have and we just, glue them together using these epsilon transitions from a starting state and an end state. So this is how we express the input can either match this one or the input can match this one. And the way the non-deterministic finite automaton works 
is that we're just basically following both state machines at the same time because we can be in multiple states. As a simple example, let's look at, again, let's look at A or B. So the machine to match A is just this. The machine to match B is this. So here's our pre-made, you know, our already existing machines. And we just use this pattern to implement alternation. Questions on this? Make sense? Okay, maybe this is maybe this is pretty straightforward. Clean closure is a little bit more subtle. <clears throat> if you work through it, it's kind of what you'd expect. You'd want to use an epsilon transition to just restart that machine, restart matching that machine. That's what epsilon transition means. The tricky part here is this extra epsilon transition between the starting and the end state. So can anyone see why we have this other transition here? Why isn't it sufficient just to have this epsilon transition back to the starting state? So somebody has zero. So hopefully, yeah, I think you mean the zero or more part. Yeah, exactly right. So clean star means zero or more. If we just had this inner one where it was just going to the beginning, that would be one or more. So clean star is zero or more. So we have this transition that immediately goes from the, from the starting state to the end state. Basically, clean closure can be the empty string. Right, exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. So our previous example, and we'll, we're, we're, we'll, we're gonna do that. Let's do that previous example. Oh, that's right here, okay. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is what our previous example looks like if we use this systematic kind of template approach to turn this into a non-deterministic finite automaton. But let's, let's do this piece by piece. Uh, let, let, let's, yeah, let's, let's do this carefully. Okay, now because I didn't go into, you know, how we, the dragon book will actually walk into how you turn the, the regular expression into a tree and then you walk through it. Well, let's see if we can kind of do this a little bit more intuitively. We just need to make sure we preserve order of operations. Here's our regular expression again. Okay, so again, what's the first, in the order of operations, what is the first operation here? Or, good, good. So it's oring two other regular expressions, but those regular expressions are just matching a single. Um, the regular, the dragon book is recommended. Piracy is not recommended. The book is recommended, but there are, it's recommended because there are other resources that you can use that are um, free and, and, and non-commercial that you can use. So the, there are lots of websites. There's my notes to some degree. There's um, lots of YouTube videos that walk through this. Now, some of the YouTube videos are a little weird the way they do it. So I, I, when I say free resources, I mean free, non-commercial, non-pirated versions. There's tons and tons of compiler classes that, I mean, for decades, the same content has been gone over and over and over. I mean, I, I have the drag, I actually have multiple copies of the Dragon Book because I love compilers and it's my, it's my interest. So I, I, have, I kept these, I did not sell these back after my class. Okay, so the or is between, yeah, I know there's, I know there's, there's very little time in class. So the or is between two other regular expressions, A and B, or the, the, the regular expression for A and the regular expression to match B. And so or is just using this little epsilon trick to make or. Make sense? So I, I forgot the start state here. I'll just put the start state here. So start state, we also just use an epsilon transition to, to start the thing off. Okay. Oh, whoops, whoops. Let me not put the start state state. Whoops, 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 whoops. Got ahead of myself. Okay, so here's our or. All right, now the next thing we need to do is, which the next operation that we need to, to do here? Clean star, good. 
So remember, our pattern for clean star takes any regular expression, we don't care what it is, any regular expression that has a starting state and an ending state, and we put it into, well, yeah, anyway. Oh, I just killed my iPad feed. Or it crashed. So the clean star one was, if you remember, this, where the starting state has an immediate transition to the ending state and the end state of the expression that we are turning into a clean star has an epsilon transition from the from its end state to its starting state. Let me draw this a little more nicely. Here's our sub expression. And here's our clean star. And of course we need the epsilon trend, whoops. The UFO is back. Questions on this? And then, oh good, unidentified finite object. That's very clever. Uh, and then it's just concatenation. So we have, I mean, th this is pretty straightforward. I think you guys can figure this out. All right, questions on this? Questions? Yeah, it's a uh, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a systematic way to to convert between regular expressions to NFAs. Okay, but an NFA is not something that well you can implement an NFA on a machine by simulating simulating uh, keeping you know keeping track you can simulate it by keeping track of all possible states, uh, but for performance purposes, lexing tools these these uh, regular expression tools will usually convert them to a deterministic finite automata. So it turns out that <clears throat> we can also automate, there's, a, there's this one-to-one -one correspondence, or at least um, any regular expression that can be represented with a DFA can be represented with an NFA and vice versa. They're n neither is more powerful than the other. Even though we can be in multiple states at the same time, uh, we can always represent that with a deterministic finite automata. The intuition behind this is that whenever we're in multiple states at once, we can represent the fact that we're in multiple states in the NFA with a new DFA. We can create a new DFA whose states represent all the possible states that the NFA is in at any given time. Makes sense kind of intuitively? So, uh, ooh, yeah, I was going to say go to lab for this, but I, I hadn't put the announcement out yet, but I think lab is, has to be canceled today. One of the uh, TAs is unable to make it, and I can't get in touch with the other TA. Um, so lab today, I think it's going to be canceled. I was going to say we can go to lab to review this more. Um, uh, well, there's the lab I don't think can be held. I, I'm going to see if I can get in touch with the the other TA to hold it, but they're not, haven't been responding to me for a while. Uh, anyway, so in this 10 minutes, I'll show, I'm gonna walk through the, the, um, the, the subset construction algorithm, which converts from an NFA to a DFA. Okay. So let's see.
Okay, so let's go through the algorithm. Let's go through the algorithm. So the way it works is we start at the starting state of the NFA, and then we take all the states that are reachable by the epsilons. This is called the epsilon closure. This is basically all the states that you would be in if you were matching the input and you reached an epsilon. The epsilon puts you in multiple states, recall. Uh-oh, where's my chat? So I, I, if anyone's just sent me a message, I, I lost it in the chat because I had to restart my chat. So send, send if you have questions. So the epsilon closure is all the states that are reachable just by following epsilons. Because when, you know, in a non-determinist final automaton, if you're reading the input and you, you reach epsilons, you would just automatically move to all those possible states at the same time. And we're gonna call that initial group, that initial epsilon closure, that initial group of states, the starting state of the DFA. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because when we're following the NFA, the very first states that we enter when we enter this starting state is we just enter all of these states at the same time. We would enter, we'd be in this starting state and we'd, the first thing that we would do in this machine is we would enter all of these states at the same time, all of these ones that are reachable through an epsilon transition. Uh, and then, so then what we do is we basically go through and build up the transition table for a deterministic automaton where each state is some subset of the NFA states. So we just walk through the table one at a time, one uh, cell at a time. So for, we start at a state and we walk through each possible input and see which NFA states that, that, uh, that it'll be in for a, each possible transition from that input. And we include all of the epsilon states that are reachable from that, from that new state. And that new state, we call that a single state of the discrete finite automaton. And once we've done that, we're done. We've done that for all possible states. Now we have a DFA that basically simulates that, that NFA. Questions on this? Oh yeah, so number of possible DFA states, right. Yeah, so somebody mentioned that the number of DFA states is two to the number of NFA states. And that's because it's the power set. It's the power set of NFA states. Because uh, the DFA, the, the NFA at any given point can be in any combination of its states. So all possible combinations of states is the power set of states. And the power set of states is uh, the number of states in the power set is two to the, to the, I think that's right, right? So I'm not a format guy, but you know, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's the case. Okay, let's go through this, let's go through this algorithm. So this is what you'll do for homework. And so, you know, I'll have office hours, so sorry for not having labs. If there's an issue, um, we'll see if we can record something, but yeah, if you have an issue and a lot of people are having trouble, then um, we'll, we'll see what kind of supplemental stuff we can do. Uh, but you know, Take a look at the video, take a look at other videos, look at the Dragon Book if you have it, look at other websites. Yeah, and so for people who did discrete, you'll actually see where this is used. I mean, this is used in Flex, this is used in every, pretty much every compiler is have some, some a bunch of, probably a bunch of state machines uh, that, that, that are being implemented. Okay, so let's, let's do this algorithm for, for our, for our NFA. So I'm gonna be kind of switching back and forth between this, this uh, diagram. Actually, let me, let, me, um, let me redraw this to be something a lot easier to look at. So I think this will be helpful to have it on the same page. I know we're running low on time. This is too slow. Let me just draw it more carefully. One, two. Already made a mistake. 
join office hours, join on the gather link. It's in web courses on the very front page of the course. Make sure I'm getting this right. What am I doing wrong? Oh, okay. So I am rushing too much here. Any mistakes? Whoops, lots of mistakes. Okay, there's our non-deterministic finite automaton. So if you, if, you, if you need to leave, this is being recorded. So you can, you can go back and, and double check this for your homework. I suspect you'll need to do this anyway. Uh, but okay, so let's do the algorithm. So here is our DFA. And, the, and here's our inputs. Okay, so the first thing we do is we need the starting state and we take the starting state by taking the NFA starting state and including all possible states from the epsilon closure. The epsilon is an input. The epsilon is an input that means an empty string. So empty strings can always be matched. They're just kind of a conceptual artifact, artifice, like, like uh, they're, they're conceit, like the number zero, like a zero a number, zero is, zero is a, a number that represents no number. So it's similar, similar to that, where you can always match empty input. So we have one, two, three, four, and of course I forgot more stuff here. All right, so I, I, I botched this a little bit, but let's just, let's just pretend that that starting state is the same. Yeah, so I, I messed this up. I messed this up already. Oh, and one minute left. Ah. Let's just do AB as our new thing to match here. Okay, so we take all of the elements in the epsilon transition. So zero, one, two, three, four. Anything else? Did I miss anything? So we've got, that was the epsilon transition. It goes from zero to one, one to two, two to three, two to four, and one to eight. So this set of states becomes a new state in our DFA, a discrete finite automaton. So then, we fill out the table in the DFA for each possible input. And the way it works is if we're on A, if we see A as the input, we need to look at every possible state in the NFA to figure out every possible state that it can reach. And that new subset of states becomes a new state in our DFA. So from A, what are all the possible states that we can transition to? So we're in, we're in state zero, doesn't transition anywhere. State one doesn't, state two doesn't, state four doesn't, 
state eight can transition to nine and state three can transition to five. So those are the two possible states that we can transition to. So that three five combination state becomes a new state, but three and five also have epsilon transitions. That signifies the fact that if we're in this state, we're also in seven, eight, two, three, and four. Now let's do it this way. So seven, eight, two, three, and four. And same for B. So B can be in state six, seven, B transitions to state six, seven, eight, two, three, and four. You guys with me on this? If you're still here, I have three twice. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Uh, sorry, would you be able to explain the, so I understand how you got the three and five for um, the A, but could you explain uh, like the seven, eight, two, and four again, if you don't mind? Uh, the seven, eight, two, and four is the epsilon closure. That is, if we're in state five, we can always match an empty input. So that, that's how we were able to do alternation in non-deterministic finite automata, because we can be in multiple states at the same time. And you can think of it as like being in state five also means you're in all these other states at the same time. It's a way to transition states without having to read the input. It's another way to, to think about it. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, thank you. So that's how we got the other ones. So the, the, you see the procedure in the slides. And if you look at, you know, look in the Dragon Book, look in, look in other, other slides. Yeah, seven back to two, yeah. So you just have to kind of walk through this. The order of the set doesn't matter. So sets, sets in the uh, like math definition are, un, unordered, uh, are unordered and they don't matter here as well. Okay. So then we take these two new sets, two new sets that we created. So I'm going to call this set A, or I'm going to call it set uh, number uh, number one. Well, let's do it this way. So let's call this set one, this set two, and this set three. So then we find all of the transitions for these two new sets, the same way that we did for set one, set num uh, Roman numeral one. So from Roman numeral two, transitioning with input A, what are all the possible states that we can reach from that input? So we're right now, we're in set five, seven, five, three, five, set, Okay, this is not set three, sorry, made a mistake. It shouldn't be in set one, no. So set one, you can see that it has no uh, in, in edges, so it can never be transitioned to again. But I'll just go through it and then um, you can uh, rewatch this when you're, when you're doing your homework. So if you need to leave, by all means, um, I'm going over now. But I'll leave this in the recording, so when you go to do your homework, you can go back and see how this set transition goes. And I'll try to, I'll try to complete this. And let me know if you have questions uh, while I'm doing this and I'll, I'll try to talk through it. Okay, so we, we started in our starting state. We did the epsilon closure of that. that. That led to Roman numeral state one. And we found all possible transitions from all those states using input A. And that led us to DFA state Roman numeral two. Eight shouldn't be in set one. Ah, so eight is in set to Roman numeral A because it's eight, uh, Roman numeral one because of this transition here. This is an epsilon transition. There probably are visualizers for this actually. Okay, I'll, let me walk through. So now we're in uh, uh, Roman numeral state Roman numeral two. Uh, and so we just look at all of its transitions with A. So state eight can transition to nine. And is there anything else that I'm missing? So state, oh, there is state three, sorry. So state three 
also transitions to state five. And five has all these epsilon closures. What's the least number of states you can build this NFA in for? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know. You'd have to look at the, uh, if it's an NFA, yeah, there are algorithms for, I think, minimizing these. Check out the uh, Dragon Book, but I, I'm not familiar with them off the top of my head. Uh, okay, so because state five, I'm sorry, state new Roman numeral two can transition to state five again, it can transition to state uh, nine. Uh, our new state has state nine and five and the epsilon closure of all of these. So that's state two, three, and four. Let's call this Roman numeral state four. Similarly, state B, the, the um, input B can transition to so we're in state six. Okay, so it can only transition to three. Oops. Uh -oh. Lots of technical difficulties today. Okay, so when we're state six, we can't transition anywhere. State seven can't transition, it can't transition anywhere. Eight can't, two can't on B. Four can transition to state six, which means we also have state seven. We have state two, three, four, and eight. And now I didn't write this nicely, but notice that the state that transitions from Roman numeral two to with B, these are actually the same set. So there's no need to create a new DFA set for this. So we can just reuse state three for this. Wow, this is really going slow. Might be possible to hit 10. How can, so you're saying 10 can be hit from which state? So if we're in state three, Roman numeral three. Yeah, exactly, you'd need an input to, so epsilons, you don't need an input to transition. So let's do, let's do, let, let me uh, finish this out in the two minutes that I have for those who can rewatch this um, when they do their homework. Okay, so state nine, A can't transition anywhere. Uh, five can't transition anywhere. Seven can't transition. Eight, eight can transition to nine. Two, nothing. Three can't transition to five again. And then the epsilon closure is eight, two, three, four again. And notice that Again, we've, we have a subset of NFA states that we've seen before that we call Roman numeral four. If we transition from Roman numeral three on B, let's see what we get. So six goes to nothing, seven goes to nothing on B, two goes to nothing on B, three goes to nothing on B, four goes to six on B, which means we have DFA state Roman numeral three again. And now hopefully the last state that we need to look at is state four. Okay, good, I'm glad this is, this is making sense. And my apologies again for going over and uh, making this a little rushed. So state four has two transitions uh, on A. It can't go, nine can't go anywhere, five can't go anywhere, seven can't go anywhere, eight can't go anywhere, two can't go anywhere, three can go to state five. Um, four can't go anywhere. So once we're in state five, 
we have the, the closure, epsilon closure of seven, eight, two, three, and four, which is a state that we've already seen. And that's state two. And finally, uh, ooh, thank you. Can go to nine. Right, 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 right. Good, good, thank you. Uh, I can also go to state nine, right? So I missed state nine, which means, but which is also a state we've seen before, which is state four, if I'm not mistaken. And then finally, our final state, the only thing that it can go to, state four on B, uh, state four, and let me not rush here. So five can go nowhere, nine can't go anywhere, seven, no, two, no, I'm sorry, nine can go to 10, obviously, and four can go to six. And then we have the, clean closure of this. I'm sorry, not the clean closure, the epsilon closure. So here's our new state. State five. So state five, oh man. State five is the accept state and it actually can't go anywhere either. Uh, you can use the use the show the table for the trans transformation, but for the NFA you can just use. You don't have to draw the table for the NFA. You can just draw the diagram. Uh, and on one point in our, our accept state, you know, this is our accept state. We can't go anywhere on our accept state. So just to kind of bring this home real quick, I know I'm <laughs> running really really late, but this is recorded, so hopefully people can fast forward and rewatch this. Uh, this is just a transition table that for a DFA that we can draw diagrammatically. And of course, this has to be extremely slow right now. State one goes to state DFA state two on A. It goes to DFA state three on B. State two goes to state four. Oh, come on. I've already written this out, I thought. Goes to state four on A, and it goes to state three on B. State three goes to state four on A, and it goes to state yeah, I may have messed up something here, but it says it goes to state three on B. Yeah, this might be wrong. And then state four goes to state five on B, and it goes to state four on A. Oh no, maybe this is right. Yeah, I think this is right. So anyway, yeah, so now this is the DFA version of the NFA. Okay. So sorry for going over so much. This is recorded. So for those of you who are able to stay or weren't able to stay, um, hopefully they can watch the recording. Uh, I think hopefully they should know that. I think I, think I mentioned this. I'm going to transition over to gather for office hours in just a second, in just about a minute. So thank you all for, for bearing with me on this. Um, if you have questions on the homework and it's too much of an issue, we'll try to release some supplementary materials. There's plenty of YouTube videos and other, other sites that will walk you through this as well, though, in addition to this recording. Um, yeah, so for each Roman normally look for A and B. So this is basically just taking a transition diagram, a transition table and turning it into a state diagram. For questions, yeah, okay. I think I covered all the questions. All right, everybody. Thanks for bearing with me on this and take care. <laughs>